so we're gonna we're continuing on with uh, First Corinthians, our verse by verse. It's been quite a ride so far, hasn't it? Yeah. All right. Well, the ride ain't over yet. I can assure you. And uh, <clears throat> it's a great book. Um, tough sometimes, but keep in mind all this stuff that we that we go through in First Corinthians, that Paul was uh, trying to teach them through the Holy Spirit was all for their benefit to grow in the Lord. And those that struggled, you know, with, with these teachings were those that were struggling with the teaching, right? So let me, before I, we go into First Corinthians, let me preface this over here in uh, Proverbs 9 right quick. I want to kind of set the tone for what's going to be going on here tonight. Amen? <clears throat> and it goes like this. Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are the depths of hell. I know, right? Fasten your seat, bells. <laughs> Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord, and uh, we do invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, Lord, to, to show us the, the glorification of your word here, Father, and the edification of it. Help us to grow in your word, Father. And Lord, we ask that you open our eyes and ears and our hearts for every word you have in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's move on to chapter, the second half of chapter six as we move through this thing and and keep in mind that, you know, all through this uh, book that we've been through right now, Paul's been addressing problems in the Corinthian church, the, uh, the very young Corinthian church, you know, within probably a year or two um, that the church was established. And, and so there was a lot of the world still intermingling within the church, and it was creating, um, obviously, a lot of problems within the church. But... Um, obviously, Paul saw something really important and big, which it was. It was an important church. Um, the crazy thing is, though, as we've been going through this, um, I, I was kind of doing some research on the subject and in terms of Christianity in our country and the, the rise and the decline of um, Christianity, I guess is probably the, the best way to, to put it. And I'll talk about that more next week when we go into the seventh chapter there. But the, the interesting thing I found was that we, uh, you know, from the founding of our nation, um, there were Christian values. And, and there, there wasn't as many people here, obviously, but Christian values were, were very high. The founding of our, like our, all of our, our Bill of Rights, our Constitution is all God. And then as uh, wars broke out and things like that, there was a real decline um, especially uh, during the Revolutionary War and even the Civil War. And, and one of the reasons for the decline was the churches were burned down and uh, they, they weren't fellowshipping anywhere. But coming out of World War II, World War I and World War II, there was a big resurgence again. And the things that were, uh, that were happening that we're, we're talking about here in, in Corinth, they, they were not even uh, considered. And I mean, it wasn't that they didn't happen or anything like that, but everything was very hush-hush. And even um, even the hint of such immorality like that was uh, was enough for people to lose jobs and you know all kinds of other things of that nature. But as a nation, we've been declining uh, pretty pretty drastically. Even even numbers in churches have declined um, pretty significantly. And with the advent of social media and other forms of um, information, we've I think we. I believe anyway that we have become very desensitized to a lot of things. Things that before would have been like even war, for instance, um, and the horrors of war. We have such visuals on everything now. It, it's not something that we you know, imagine in our mind. Um, we see all the horrors of that. We see everything right in front of our eyes. And I think that that's probably part of the the desensitization of, desensitizing of all this stuff. And so what I'm seeing here as we're going through this is kind of a, a moving backwards back to this time of Corinth when that place was under Roman rule and it was all about money and greed and power and sex. They had this uh, temple of, uh, that was her name? Aphrodite, yeah. It was in a kiss song, I think, wasn't it? daughter of if I died or something like that and so it was all but it was uh it was culturally okay up until 
Paul introduced Christianity there, and then it was kind of like, like you know, being on a, a speeding train and hitting a wall for these people. And so as we're moving through all this stuff, there's a lot of information here that still pertains to us today in America. Amen? And so as we dig into this thing, um, some of this stuff's been a little bit challenging, but this is where he, he kind of continues on with the whole thing about sexual immorality. And that's another thing that's prevalent in the Church of America and America. And as you know, man, everything, some of the stuff that is acceptable now is absolutely foul as far as I'm concerned. Um, the things that are like, uh, you know, Super Bowl half times, you know, things that are just like, really? You're going to, kids are watching and all this stuff, but it, it just doesn't matter. And, you know, because they didn't really give a crap what, you know, kids saw. But as the years progress, the things they're introducing to kids now, the halftime stuff looks tame compared to some of the stuff the children are being exposed to now. And, man, we got to do something about that. We, we really have to step up and there's a lot of people that are stepping up to that right now but before we do any of that we need to fix us first amen and this is what this is all about so we're starting off here in uh in chapter 6 verse 12 the second half this is the opening what is the biggest challenges to sexual purity in our society today well for sure today it's the advent of the internet 20 years ago 25 years ago maybe maybe a little more than that it was like uh, billboards and Sears catalog. <laughs> if your dad left a Playboy out, then wow, you know, I was like, that was something. Or your mom left a Playgirl. You girls aren't off the hook in this, all right? But it was, uh, you know, that that was that was kind of stuff where, you know. If your mom walked in the room or something like that, you know, you'd be flipping out, man, trying to shove those things under your pillow or something like that. And now, you know, it's right in your pocket on your phone, you know, or on your and 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 the so what's called social media, which you would think that, you know, and I believe in the beginning it was it was a lot more um, managed, I guess you could say. Um, but now it, it's almost like a competition to see who could be more vulgar or more outlandish, you know. And this is where the desensitization, desensitizing starts to come in there to the point where it doesn't um, hurt us anymore. It doesn't hurt us as Christians even to, to wallow into these things like it, it would have 20 or 30 years ago. But I don't, I don't think, you know, we're hopeless. I do believe that God's Spirit's moving, and I do see other groups of people moving against that stuff, and, I would, and I'm praying that the church is, like, right in the front line of all that stuff, to not just be like a bunch of sin sniffers pointing fingers, but to be there with the Word to help lift people back up from where they're at right now, maybe, like, shake shake them out of the stupor that they're in right now to show them the, how far God's, God's glory is and the world's ugliness is. Because I think there's a big mish, mishmash in the middle there. But he goes like this, verse 12, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And at this time in church history, there'd, there'd already been big battles over circumcision for Gentiles that would, that would come into the church, Christianity, and some believe that um, as Jews, as Jewish men are circumcised at 8, I think, or 12, I can't remember which age it was, and it was a, it was a sign um, by God to identify them as Jewish, and they felt that um, anybody that came in, Greeks, Romans, anybody, if, if they wanted to be part of the church, then they had to get snipped, you know, and uh, I think, I don't remember, personally, I was pretty young, but I think that, you know, someone that's maybe in their 20s or 30s, that would be a pretty uh, difficult procedure, right? I mean, at that point, you've kind of grown attached, if you will, and, you know, And then another group, you know, said, no, that's, that's not, that, 
that was a Jewish thing, all right? These, these, this is a Christian thing. These people are coming into the Christian faith, so they're not in the law. Well, well, Paul could have, you know, really pushed all that and said, you know what, I'm a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee, I'm highly educated, and yeah, I think that Crusher needs to get clipped, you know, before he can say, I'm a Christian. But then Paul says, is that helpful? Because how many, you know, just use your imagination, how many men said, oh, hell no. Uh -uh. I'm not going to be part of this church, man. No way. If that's what you're demanding upon me. And, and what Paul's saying here, though, is that even though it's the law for the Jews, it's not helpful to grow the church of Christ. And he says, I'm not going to be held under that stuff where, where many were. Many were held under different laws and things like uh, food, dietary things, you know, the eating of meat, sacrifice to idols and this and that. And it caused so much division and problem. And Paul's going, look, man, God made the meat. In fact, he'll talk about that in just a second here. It's, it's not so much that someone took a, a ribeye and set it in front of some you know, statue or something like that. And now the meat is somehow corrupted or possessed by some demon or something like that. The, for for the, the Jews, the, the law was written that to not, to not worship idols in the first place or have anything to do with them because God knew that they were fickle and they would you know, fly to one side or the other. So understanding the context of the laws and, and kind of like God's plan on that. And so Paul's going, look, you can eat that meat. It, if you're eating that meat, though, with the idea that every bite, I'm going to get a little more of that demon in me. Well, then obviously you're eating that wrong or if you're eating that meat just to irritate him because you know that it's going to make him crazy every time you take a bite of that meat there then you're eating that wrong but in and of itself it's a piece of steak man and so paul's going look i'm not going to be brought under the power of all that stuff either kind of a it's kind of a long way around saying to choose your battles wisely so to speak and paul's battles were about winning souls and planting churches right so he goes on to say this, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will raise up and raise us up in his power. So Paul's making a, a great argument here that God created this stomach that we all have here for a reason. And the reason was to digest food, right? That's the whole plan behind the stomach. And not only that, but he designed the food that would go into the stomach that could be digested by the stomach. And, and that's all part of God's grand plan, but in the end, they're both going to die. Well, the food's probably already dead, unless you eat something that's living, I guess. But the body would die too, the point being that God's in control of all of this stuff. God designed things for a specific purpose. And you want to know something? He's really good at designing stuff. You know, he, he designed the sun and the moon, and, and they're, they're flawless, man. What, what would we do without the sun and the moon? I mean, of course, without the sun, we, we'd be pretty cold. But I don't know if people really realize how important the moon is to our planet. Just all the, the tides and everything else. God is, God is a master designer. And so we can all agree that God is the master designer, that everything he, everything he did, there's nothing that God didn't design perfectly and with great thought, great planning, and, and, and long-term plans for this stuff. So we can agree that just in the stomach alone is what Paul's saying. Look, God designed this flawlessly. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And the food that we eat does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's all part of life and living. And then he goes on to say this. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. So he didn't design us to be doing all this crazy stuff. And there was a reason for that. Because remember that proverb back there? And it said this uh, stolen water is sweet and bread is eaten in secret is pleasant. Well, it is, and God knows that because he's the one that, that said sin's fun for a season, and it is. If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it, right? But inevitably, it leads to this death. One way or another, outside of God's will, I don't think I've ever known any Christians that have gone down this path and ended up doing really well in the end. It always seems to blow up, right? So he's going like this. And God both raised up the Lord 
and he will also raise us up by his power. So even though it's, it's challenging, it's hard, it's difficult to, to go through those things, when we put our trust in God and not in our flesh, just like he raised Jesus from the dead, his promise is that he'll raise us up through that as well. And anything else that, that we encounter, this particular thing was a big problem in Corinth because this is all part of the culture. And, and that's why I was associated with America today because it's become such a part of our culture now. It's, it's not shocking anymore. It's, it's not something that, you know, people are like, oh, really? Wow, they're, they're up to that or they're doing this or, or whatever. No one seems to give a rip anymore. No one, no one even really talks about it because it's so matter of fact now. And it ought not be that way because God designed us to have this gift. And it's a gift, all right? From God, it's a gift of procreation. It's a gift of life. And it's a gift of love that God gave a man and a woman to share. And did I say a man and a woman? Let me say it again. A man and a woman, okay, to share. That's, you know what? That's why the parts are different. <laughs> okay, anyway. Yeah. I don't know. You guys do know the parts are different, right? Okay, just, just check. I know it's hard to tell these days, man. You never really know what's going on out there, which is another, another sign of, of this kind of a culture, how things you know, can, can become like perverted, but then they can go, like just when you think you've seen it all, you haven't seen it all. And, and new things are, are cropping up. Um, I, was, I was doing some study on, on something. I don't remember what I was, I was looking at or what I was, I was trying to figure out the LGBTQ, LGBTQ, A, T, plus or something like that. And I was trying to get the names, you know, what they all were. And, and it was, it, every, the deeper I went, the further there was more thing. There, there's like, I don't even remember what it would now, what it was. It was like, there's like 65 classifications. Now that's like more than all the letters in the alphabet, yeah. you know, to try to pack into this thing. And some of them were absolutely, um, like, man, I'm not knocking anybody in here. All right. But, um, there was one that I came across. It was map and it was minor attracted people or something like that. I don't know. And it was a real nice way to say a pedophile. And, and the argument that was going on there was that, well, this is, who, this is who they're attracted to sexually, so they need to be protected. And I'm like, bull crap. They need to be put in prison so they don't hurt children. All right? These, at some point, we have to, we have to put a, draw a line in the sand, man, and go, look, you want to be freaky out there and do whatever you do? You knock yourself out. You got to work out your salvation between you and God, all right? But the children, yeah, man, it, we have got to make a stand, man, in prayer and whatever it takes. We've got to protect our children from all this, this nonsense. It, it, I would say it's gone too far, but it's ridiculously, like, it, that's not even a strong enough term for me to describe what my granddaughters and my grandchildren, my grandsons have to encounter. In, in the school systems and things of that nature. And uh, me, for one, I ain't having it, man. Um, if that makes me a bigot or whatever the heck it is, then I'll be a big bigot. Because they're not getting to my kids, man. And, and I have God's word behind me on this. So he's saying, in all of this stuff, put your trust in him, and he'll raise us up. To be honest with you, I mean, we don't have a lot of strength to battle that battle except God. With God, nothing's impossible. We can stand in that gap. Well, the same thing that was, that was going on here that's still going on today in America, that's a tough battle to fight too sometimes. But if we're only fighting in our own strength, like, boy, you know, I wish I wasn't doing this or I wish I wasn't doing that, you're probably just okie doking yourself on that stuff because you really don't want to get out from under that on one hand, but then on the other, it's so much work to try to keep everything secret and to try to do all this and do all this crazy stuff. There, there's a side of you that doesn't want to fight this fight anymore. Well, look, God is there, man. If, and if you're battling that right now, talk to the Lord about it, man. I know, I know sometimes 
things like this seem like they're impossible to step out of. But I assure you, man, the, the love and, and grace and mercy that God pours upon anybody, man, that turns away from something and turns, into, turns to him will blow your mind, man. God is, God is amazing on how he can fill what you think is unfillable in your life. Because the truth of the matter is, what you're trying to fill that emptiness with can only be filled by God. And anything else you try will never satisfy. And it'll never last. It's always going to be temporary. And it always leads to death. Now, I don't mean, you know, physical death, but certainly spiritual death. And he goes on in 15 and says this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? That's heavy, man. That we give our life to Christ. You know when we give our life to Christ? We receive Jesus into our heart. We're in dwell with the Holy Spirit, right? But it's not just our heart. It's not just a, a, a mind thing, you know? When, when we give our lives to Christ, our lives include our bodies as well, which, which obviously has everything to do with this. When we're, when we're representing Christ as our Savior, the way we act out in the world, the things that we do, it all pertains to this. Our body, the things that we do. You know, we're out beating people up and stuff like that. That's not cool, man. You know, and, and any time that, that you, your body is involved in something and, and you're seen, which that whole secret bread thing, that's, a, that's, that's sarcasm. Stuff isn't as secret as you might think it is, especially in this day and age. Have you guys noticed that there's cameras everywhere? You know, you know the crazy thing, man, is your phone. You know that thing listens to you and sees you even when it's off, man? You can be talking about like a guitar app or something like that and turn your phone on. And you know what pops up on your phone? that guitar app right there and you're like wow what a coincidence because we're like cattle <laughs> duh well well that's a blessing from god <sighs> that's ai man and and the worst part is you got to wonder who's on the other side listening recording compiling if you will but that's just a cell phone understand this that god is omnipotent he's way more involved in than a cell phone. And, and what Paul's telling us here is that when we've given our life to Christ, we have given our bodies onto Christ as well. And so everything that we do from, from that point on of giving our life to Christ is taking Christ with us wherever we go and whatever we do, the Holy Spirit that resides in us, everything. And he's going, so, so should I... He says, should I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. I mean, when you think about it from in that perspective, no, we're not going to do that, man. What do, you, what do you think? I mean, how do you try to get a visual of that? You, them, and the Holy Spirit or the Trinity all boom, shakalaka, bam, wacka, wacka. I don't know how you want me to put it there, but or anything else that you may be doing an armed robbery or something like that. How do you reconcile the fact that you're a Christian doing these things? How do we? Because we, we, can, we can suppress the Holy Spirit. We can push the Holy Spirit down. So maybe, maybe in the beginnings of whatever it is you're up to, whatever's going on, whether it's this or anything else, you might feel that um, guilt or shame associated with something. But as time goes on and it continues and continues, before long you don't feel that anymore. And you kind of sear your heart against that and and then we get further and further and further and further away from god and and there might even be like a sweet spot somewhere in there where you're like whoo man this is all good and and in in that sweet spot is when we start justifying what we're doing and he's going to talk about that here in a second as well but that justification never lasts man and then eventually we come to the other side where things aren't all that fun anymore they're not all that great and you turn around, you know, to maybe inquire of God, and you realize you're a million miles away from God. And you've allowed yourself to drift out into this bloody ocean, and you find yourself all alone out there, man. And it's a horrible place to be for a Christian. Amen? He goes like this. 
Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And he started all that right there with these words. Do you not know? Do you not understand that? Do you don't get it? Have you dulled yourself so much that none of that even, and, and like, you don't need me to tell you that either. We, we all know we're all grown-ups here. And, and we, we understand God's laws. We understand God's word. We understand obedience, and we understand consequences. But he's going, do you guys not know this, that what you're doing is including the Trinity into everything that you're doing? And not only are you including the Trinity, but everything that you're doing that's being watched and seen by other people is a slap in the face to Christ. Because that's the ammunition that the world out there needs to say, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Look at you. You call yourself Christians. Anybody ever heard that before? And you call yourself a Christian. That's a good question in light of that, don't you think? I mean, for us, it probably sting a little bit. Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what are you swinging from the chandelier naked for then? You still call yourself a Christian? That's a tough one right there, right? It's pretty hard to, to justify your actions when the spotlight's on. And, and here, you, here's something you need to know, man. The spotlight always goes on, eventually. It's just a matter of time. And that sucks. So for him, he's going, look, you can be joined with this, with this harlot, which, you know, however, I, I mean, we, we understand what he's, he's kind of aiming this at, like, uh, the prostitutes. Obviously, they had, like, the, the temple of, uh, what was the name again? Aphrodite, Aphrodite up there. And, and they would come down every night, you know, 500, 1,000 of them just roamed through the city. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, you had to drive around and find a prostitute or something somewhere or whatever the heck they were. Their temple priests, they're still doing the same thing. It was, it was like... Uh, I don't know, probably like uh, so matter of fact, like maybe you're ordering some falafel or something like that, you know, and then here comes the girls and probably guys, no doubt. It was a pretty freaky time, which you know what, again, that's not so far from where we are today, is it? It's really not. Would, you know, and, and that wasn't that long ago that that was pretty like, oh, wow, man, you know, that's, that's not even cool. No, no, don't do that in front of me. We, we've become so desensitized to the things that are so anti-God. And, and as Christians, we need to shake the cobwebs loose, man, and get back to some morality, me included, all of us here. We've all been desensitized to the Word of God. And we come to church all the time, man. We study the Word, yet out there in the world, we're intermingling, so to speak. Social media is all that stuff. And, and if you really think about it, if you were to scrub your social media, all of it, like Facebook, Instagram, whatever the other one is, tic-tac-toe, that one, you know, how much would you have on your media? What would be on there left for you to go look at? I mean, if, you, if you look through your lists, you know, of people that, or things or whatever that interest you, and, and you were like to really clean out, I mean, really go through hardcore, clean everything out of there that, that is not glorifying to God, that would be offensive to someone lost that you're trying to minister to as a Christian, as a man or woman of God, and you cleaned it all out, it, imagine how much time you spend on social media right now as opposed to how much time you spend on social media then. You'd have so little to look at on there. Three or four or five, you know, music sites or whatever the heck it is you might you know be interested in but if you really just scroll through and just give it give it do a test do it yourself go on your facebook go on your little phone after church please <laughs> and start scrolling through there and be totally honest all right totally honest with yourself and go yeah not that one scroll through not that one just do like a hundred like scroll through a hundred things and out of those hundred how many would you remove off your phone if you were if you chose to do that is what i'm saying and how many things would be left and it's not to knock anybody here or be mean or anything like that it's just to show how saturated we are in this culture right now saturated with the world and the advertising and they're really good man 
they, the, these aren't just like, you know, wackos that live in their mom's basement, man. These are people with degrees in psychology that design this stuff. Did you know that um, casinos are designed to get money out of your pocket? I know, you're like, well, duh, that's no duh. Well, here, the next time you go, look up at the ceiling. And what you'll see is a ceiling that's so boring, nothing magnificent about the ceiling, that it drives your eyes down. And if you look at the carpets, there's so many weird designs and stuff like that that it drives your eyes up. And no kidding, this is just psychology. The idea is to get your eyes looking straight ahead at what? The one-armed bandits, man. But we don't, we don't think about that stuff. Look at the markets that you shop in, man. The stuff that, the high dollar stuff, it's at eye level, man. Walk around any store and look. The cheap stuff, down on the ground, man. Where you have to bend down to get it. Or when you get older, you got to like bend down just to see the, what it says on it. And other stuff is above that, but kind of the high dollar major brands will always be like at eye level right there. But this happens in all facets of our life, all kinds of areas in our life that psychology is used to draw our attention. And now with, with social media, I mean, it's just like pinging at us all. And not just social media, TV as well. The advertisers and commercials and stuff that are on TV, you know, and, and not only the weird and vulgar ones, nothing like that, but I like old westerns. That's my thing, man. Like Rifleman and I don't know, Big Valley, stuff like that, right? From like the 50s and 60s, Bonanza. And when you're watching them, it's all about Geritol commercials, man. <laughs> you know, like adult diapers and stuff like that. I'm like, hmm. That's weird. And then it dawned on me, well, yeah, the, the general age of people that probably watch those are probably, you know, 70, 80 years old or whatever, and maybe they need them. I don't know. I've, I haven't reached that point in my life yet, thank God. But if you watch another channel, though, you'll see that the advertisement is always, it's always um, aimed at the demographic of who they believe to be, you know, watching at that time. And, and you probably already know a lot of this, but what I'm saying is this stuff is so prevalent that it, it becomes the norm for us. In fact, what, you know, maybe just 10 years ago, something that we would see would be reprehensible. We're like, oh, that's not even kind of okay. And today we might just shrug our shoulders and go, that's disgusting or something like that and, and move on from it. They're, it, and it's going to get worse, man. If we, don't, if we don't watch what Paul's trying to tell us here, we're going to be so absorbed into the culture of the world that it's going to be hard for us to even identify anymore the things that, are, that God opposes. And we have to be so careful of that, man, because as we came into our faith, many of you know this, that the things that, that we used to love that God didn't, as time went on, our ideas of this stuff started changing and the things that were, were not okay with God started to become not okay with us. And the things that were pleasing to God that we wouldn't have anything to do with at one point now became, are becoming pleasing to us as we grow in the Lord. And that's how it ought to be. We ought to be growing closer and closer and nearer and nearer to our King, to be Christ-like, to be like Him. In, in a lot of these, these things that we're talking about here, but if, if we've plateaued now and we're not growing any more close to the Lord because the things that are visually just hitting us from every side, we become desensitized to. We're in a very dangerous place. Not only because our, our very witness as Christians is going to be, is kind of flatlined, but we now will become susceptible to temptation. And what I mean is, what used to be a temptation, man, is like, you know, capital T with flashing lights and stuff like that. If we're not careful, then that temptation still may be a temptation, but now the lights aren't flashing so much anymore, man. It's just like, eh, that over there now, that's a big temptation. And we've reassigned and we've allowed ourselves to take on things that just a few years ago, we wouldn't even think about it, man. It wouldn't even cross our mind. 
And Paul is, is desperately telling us here, look at what you're doing. Look at what you're doing with your own body. In fact, he's going to go on to tell us, look what, we're, look what we're doing to our own bodies as well. But in verse, at the end of verse 17, there's a great out right there. He says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. There's not anything else, not, not a wife, not a husband, not friends, nothing. It's us and God, and that's how it is. Our relationship, our salvation is between us and Jesus Christ through the grace of God. We don't need any approval from anybody out there in the world or any social media weird or wing nut that's on a keyboard telling us that our salvation is set. We know because we gave our life to Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us, we know by his word that we're his. Now, if we know that and we accept that and we all agree to that, then we also have to agree that whatever we do from this point forward in our life will drastically affect him as well. And then we have to get to the question of how much do we love God? Do we love our self flesh more than we love God? And if that's the case, if, that, if we're leaning more towards self-gratification, as opposed to glorifying God, then we're in a, a whole nother dangerous area right there. We've been blessed to be saved by the Holy Spirit, man. We've been blessed to have a relationship with Christ because most of us wouldn't even be alive right now if it weren't for the salvation that we received when we did at just the right moment in our life. We can't shrink back now. Just because the world is going to hell in a handbasket, what's the big surprise? The Bible says that's exactly what's going to happen. At the end, everything's going to go sideways and twisted. Is that going to affect our salvation, our eternity? Nope, not at all. We've been saved by grace, man. We're going to go home. We're going to be raptured out of this place. Hallelujah? Hallelujah. But what about the rest of them out there? Have we got to the point where their salvation doesn't matter? Where, you know, good luck with that out there. You know, you're, you're a man dressed up like a woman. You're going to hell. What if someone looked at you and said, well, you're a tweaker on meth, you're going to hell, or you're an alcoholic, or you're a whore, or you're a this, you're a that. What if they had judged us on that and never shared the gospel and the good news with us? What shape would be and where would we be right now? Who is anybody in this room, including myself, to judge anybody outside that door that's lost right now? None of us. We're not the one that's saving them anyway. That's always tripped me out when people are like, yeah, man, I did this or that, and I saved 10 people. I'm like, okay, that's cool. I know what they're talking about, but they didn't save nobody, man. They shared the gospel, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and God Almighty saved that person, man, because they made a decision to walk with them. And yeah, we need to be part of that stuff. We need to be out there being evangelists out there in the world. We need to go out there and minister in the world and share our testimony and share our faith with people. But man, don't we need to have a pretty good testimony, though? I mean, we can't have just the testimony of, man, I was, you know, lost and broken. I got saved and I was delivered from drugs and stuff like that. Now, you know, I'm, I'm walking in faith. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer and stuff like that. Yeah, I still drink a little bit. I go get, you know, I have sex all over the place with different people. But I love them, so that's okay. That's what, this is what this is all about here when Paul's going, hey, man, these liberties that you have in Christ, you guys are taking it all wrong, man. Yeah, but the word says love covers a multitude of sins. That's a justification, man. It's a cop-out. You know, you can justify anything you want in the Bible. If you want to take the time to read through this thing, you can justify murder. You can justify all kinds of stuff in the Bible if that's what you really want to do. But if you're going to spend that much time doing all that, why don't you just walk the walk, man? Rather than try to find loopholes in there. Here's the crazy thing. God will allow you all the loopholes you want. He'll let you do whatever the heck you want out there. Your will, he gives you free will to do this stuff, but he knows what's coming down the, down the road. We get too wrapped up in our own little bubble in our own little world, and for whatever justification title we want to put on it, you know, we, just, we roll with it until the wheels fall off. And then what do we do? We run back to God, oh, Lord, help me, man, which he does. But listen, not without consequences. Just understand that, man. Obedience comes with blessing, joy, happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, all the things that we chase after in the flesh. It's already available in God. Yet the stuff we chase after in flesh always ends in some sort of a disappointment or something. But eventually, if you stumble and crumble and tumble enough, you might get it through your head that this probably isn't a good idea anymore, man. We should probably try something different. Like, I don't know, be obedient to God. Let's give that a whirl and just see how it works out. 
Remember, remember the honeymoon when you first got saved? Remember how on fire you were? Remember how we, we were just separated from the world, man, as baby Christians? The word was coming alive to us, man. We were on fire. Couldn't wait to get out there and share our faith with people, man. And once we learned how to pray, woo, then it was on, man. Now we're praying with people and stuff like that. We got some power, man. The Holy Spirit's moving through us. We could feel it you could, like you're going to burst or something like that. And then that stinking world snuck in, man. And I'm not saying we're, we're doomed because you're not. Amen. You're not doomed. That's the beauty of Jesus, man, is that he allows you turns. Amen. You can stop, drop, and roll, dick, roll right there. Put yourself, put the fire out. Get up and go, you know what? I'm turning from this stuff, man. And, and he's so faithful to forgive. You're probably going to have battle scars. Not probably you will have some battle scars and bruises and things like that. But you know what? God is so good, man, that he, he'll restore the joy of your salvation. It's over there in Psalms, man. Restore the joy. Remember the joy of your salvation? Have any of you lost that? I mean, you can be saved, man. You know we're going to heaven, but have you lost the joy of your salvation? And if you have, why? What, what did you do? What are you doing right now that's ripping off the joy of your salvation? There shouldn't be anything, man, that, steps, that gets between us and our king, man. That's where the joy of our salvation lies. But sometimes things get stuck in there. Look, just yank them out, man. It's like pulling roots. Rip them out and toss them, man. Get back to that joy. He goes on like this and says, because of all this, flee sexual immorality. And, and the word flee means run. Run, Forrest, run. Like you're running from a hungry lion or something like that. Because you can't win, you guys. There's no winning here. There was no winning before Christ, and there's definitely no winning now. In this situation, it will not work out for you. And the worst part of it is, you can get like mugged by a mugger or something like that, you know, and they're beating you up and stuff like that. That's an attack from the outside upon you. This stuff is us attacking ourselves. I, I don't know if, if uh, maybe you're one of these people that whatever it is that you're doing, whatever you're, whatever's keeping you separated from God, maybe someone truly is bending your arm to do it. Maybe you're being forced against your will, you know, to flip people off on the freeway when you're driving down the road or something like that. But I would venture to say, no, that's not what's happening, that this is of your own free will. And so he says, every sin that a man does is outside of the body, like flipping somebody off. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. We're putting ourselves into this position that is like a it's kind of like a toilet bowl it just spins downward it doesn't go up in fact if a toilet ever goes up that's not a good thing <laughs> right that's generally a bad thing because all that well okay hold on <laughs> now i'm going to tell you because when it finally crashes and burns you know what happens it overflows, it overflows. and you're dealing with it and it's a drag. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that probably was that. Uh, that was like the high from God sign. I don't know. Anyway, he goes, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Crazy, right? Did you ever consider that little nugget there? When we gave our life to Christ, we gave him everything. Well, I mean, I gave him my heart, you know, and I gave him my soul, because I sure don't want to burn in hell. But, you know, beyond that, no, man. The idea of giving our life to Christ means everything, including our members, arms and legs, and every other part, right? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and your spirit, which are God's. If we're going to be Christians, you know, here's the, here's the crazy thing, man. You know, we claim, we claim to be grateful for the work at Calvary, right? We're all grateful that Jesus went to the cross instead of us, right? I am, personally, for everything that I deserve. That's what, that's what I deserve. 
for, for receiving Jesus. We invited him into our heart for the Holy Spirit that indwells within us. We, we all rejoice on this stuff as Christians, yet it's sometimes it's just so easy to just put all that over here somewhere for just a little while. You know, well, I go run them up for a little bit. But when I get back, you know, whoop, I'll put the Jesus jacket back on. I'll put my Christian shirt back on and then, you know, I'll go to church and I'll even raise my hands at worship time and stuff like that. And I'll be everything that you want me to be, Lord, a good Christian. But out there, just so we all agree with each other here, me and you and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, I'm going to leave you here at the church. Okay, because what I'm going to be doing out there you really don't want to be part of that stuff. That's the mentality of what we're doing. We're not leaving God here in the church when we leave. I remember a lady at, in Overcomers years ago. I can't remember what her name was now. But she used to go to a bar all the time. And she was a Christian. And I'd go, so, and I asked her then, this is like 25 years ago, how do you reconcile <laughs> you know, your Christianity and a bar? And she goes, oh, it's easy. I just have Jesus wait in the car for me. So that way I know I'm going to get home safe. <laughs> And she was serious. That she feels like she pulled up a bar and he just stays in the car and she can go do whatever she wants to do and then come back and he's ready to drive her home, get her home safely. And I was thinking, oh, you're destined for a wreck, you know, or a DUI or something. I don't really know. But can we get into that mentality? How, how do we not get into the mentality when we're living and doing the things that we're doing? How can we not all of a sudden be Christian for a couple hours or whatever it is and then be Christian again on the other side of that and, and not feel like we've just smacked God or crawled up on the cross and hammered the nails in a little deeper. You know, how, does it, how do we do that? You know? But it happens, and, and this is what Paul's showing us, that we have to be mindful of this stuff. We, this stuff happens without us even really comprehending it too much you can get yourself into a whole long thing and you look back and you're like man how did three years of this get by man how have i been walking as a believer and a christian but living like that and it's a good question it's a good question that needs to be answered but here's the get it question how does advertising social media and friends encourage wrong attitudes about our bodies well we already talked about social media and advertising, it's designed to do that, man. But what about friends? Where do friends come in when they know that you're struggling in some area or something like that? And they don't want to be the bad guy. They don't want to be the one to go crush her. You need to quit kicking cats, dude. It's just not cool. <laughs> but I hate them. Huh? Okay, but they're God's creature, brother, and we need to talk about it. Well, he might go, well, I don't, I don't ever want to talk to you again then. In fact, if you have a cat, I'm going to come over and kick it tonight. Or, he's really been struggling with that cat kicking thing. He's like, I really don't like to do it, man, but I don't know. It's just kind of, I'm trapped. I'm stuck in it right now. Well, man, then we have an opportunity to minister and to help him step out of that trap that he's in right there, right? Be my brother's keeper and my sister's keeper as well. It's not comfortable, I, I know, but it's valuable. And you never know that someone can just be matter of fact, yeah, it ain't no big deal. It might be a big deal to them. And once the dialogue gets going, you might find out that you've done a great service for them in Christ. Amen. How can we avoid compromises that lead to sexual sin? I don't need to tell you guys this, man. We all, we all know what shiny things we're attracted to, right? Everybody has their shiny things out there. Whatever it is, you know what it is. Anybody want to share their shiny things? Harley. Harley's your shiny thing? Yeah. Probably others, too. We've all got shiny things, man. How do we avoid getting trapped by our shiny things? Quit going around the shiny things. <laughs> <laughs> all right? If you don't want to slip, stay out of slippery places. <laughs> right? If you're an alcoholic, is it a good idea to get a job as a janitor at a bar? Probably not. Right? If you're a pervert, should you work in an adult bookstore? Shouldn't work in a damn adult bookstore anyway, to be honest with you. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's just like, it's like common sense. And if you, when you really think about it, sometimes we go so far out of our way to get ourselves in those places, man. 
where it's like, it's not just easy. You know, you have to do some planning and working around to, you know, get all this stuff going. And, and remember back here, he said the stolen water, sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. It ain't that big of a secret, you guys, especially in a little church like this. And the people that are close to you, what you think is all secret, it's not all that secret, to be honest with you. It's just that people don't want to be the one to step up and tell you what time it is. Amen? Let me leave you with this thing in Romans that we wrap up tonight with. It's over here in Romans. It'll kind of put an exclamation point on this, maybe, for some of you. I don't know. It's over in Romans uh, 6. It goes like this. Do you not know? Here's another one of those. Duh. You don't know this? You don't get it? Or you're just pretending you don't? But he says this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? Right out the gate. It's just a fact. It is what it is. And he says, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Either way, whatever you're going to be a slave to obey, that's what you're going to be a slave to. To God or the world. And he goes, be thank but God... Be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Back to the honeymoon thing, remember? And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You couldn't tell enough people about Jesus Christ. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, which it does, it only gets worse. Now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't have to worry about God's word. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? The stuff you looked back on and who you were, the kind of person you were. Do you remember who you were before Christ and what you did? The things that you look back now. I mean, you might have even shared your testimony. It goes, yeah, well, when I, before Christ, I did this, 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 and this. You know, but I've been delivered. Well, are any of those, 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 and those back in your life now? Have, they, have you brought them back in? Of the things that you were ashamed of maybe a year or two ago when you were giving your testimony in front of everybody? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and to the end everlasting life. That's just the way it is, man. Disobedience and all the junk that we chase after in the flesh is a drag and it leads to a drag every time. There's, I don't know really anybody that's ever had a great report. But on the other hand, those things that, that, that are obedient to God that are, and it's not even hard to be obedient to God, just to walk, in, to walk with Christ. They lead to righteousness and blessings, and like I said, fulfillment. But this is what he says in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no gray area. I don't know if you noticed that or not. There's no gray area there. Either you're in or you're out. And that's what really needs to be decided by people and Christians today. Are you in or are you out? Which is it? You can't be both. Jesus even said, man, you, you're trying to be lukewarm and walk down the middle. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's pretty hardcore stuff right there. I'd have probably used a different exit, but I'm not Jesus. Thank God, right? Are we in or are we out? You, you, can, you can do that little test yourself. How's your life going right now? How do you feel, man, towards, towards God? Is he your God? Is he your savior? Is he your master? Is he your king of kings? Or is he another thing in the totality of your life? Because giving our life to Christ means that he is the thing in our life, not a thing, right? Okay, here's the application tonight. Isn't this fun? Now, I'm not saying that anybody in here is struggling with this stuff. What I'm probably more than likely, you, you know someone that is, and this will be helpful for you to share with them is all I'm saying. I'm sure everybody here is walking on water. Was that mean? A little bit. Okay. How can you remind yourself that you were bought at a price and you're a child of God, not the slave of a broken world anymore? When did we, when did we give in? Why did we give in? What did we have to gain? I don't know. I guess the bigger question is, what do we have to lose? 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. And yeah, your word's pretty tough sometimes, Father, but it's good, and it's gracious, and it's, it's, it's empowering to us, Father. And Lord, I ask you to help us to, to take in your word, Father, to examine ourselves, Lord. In fact, Lord, we ask that you examine us yourself and show us what maybe we don't even want to face, Lord. And help us to draw nearer to you tonight, Lord. And our desire is that everyone knows your Son as Savior. So as we, we pray here tonight, Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to have his way in this room, in this room, and outside of that camera as well, Father. For anybody that's never known your Son as Savior, but Lord, tonight, for anybody that's really struggling right now, and they need to really come back to you tonight, Lord. As we pray, Father, I ask that, that your heart speaks with their hearts, Father, and brings them back from wherever they're at right now, Lord, and start them over on your road, Lord. We thank you tonight, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yay. We'll have some girls praying over here. We'll have some guys praying over here. Come up, get some prayer. Don't be uh, queer. And I will see you all uh, Saturday. Friday night, movie night. That's right. Don't miss movie night. It's going to be pretty awesome. Did anybody find popcorn? I don't think so. All right, till then, keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys.